Many times when we are dealing with the Bible, um, we, we deal with it as if God is a different God. Uh, and so sometimes you get the impression as if the God of the Old Testament is a very cruel, harsh God, and the God of the New Testament is a very nice, fuzzy, warm person. Uh, it's almost as if God changes, and, and, and his word changes, and God's intentions change, and his mind changes. God never changes. God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God does not improve. God does not get better. He is. That's all. So, in, in our understanding of the scripture, we must not create a situation that gives the impression as if God improves over time and gets better over time. So maybe in the Old Testament, he was just learning the ropes and now he knows how to handle things a little better. That's why he doesn't kill people easily. Um, he's the same. His principles are the same. His word is the same. His values are the same. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. The God of Abraham is the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the same forever. Now with that in mind, you also then will have to understand that God does not make erratic demands. One moment do this and then, uh-oh, he forgets and then he's, don't do it again. No. We have to understand why sometimes it seems as if the practices are changing. And yesterday I took a little time to address that. The principles are eternal. The practices change, but the principles are eternal. And when it comes to tithes, offerings, and first fruits, it's the same principle. God never changes what he sanctions is sanctioned. All right. So today we're going to uh, look at the New Testament church. That's where uh, many times the, the issues are because people uh, would say, well, this is Old Testament. Show me in the New Testament. Uh, well, the same God of the Old Testament is a God in the New Testament. But we'll look at the New Testament and we will establish the principles in the New Testament. In the process of the this teaching, I'm speaking about Abel's offering. And Abel was the first person to give an offering. And the offering uh, was a burnt offering. And we talked about the fact that it was qualitative and it was quantitative. It was a lot of animals and he gave the quality animals as well. Um, Abel's offering therefore forms the foundation of every other giving in the Bible. Every other given in the Bible is based on what Abel did because that was the first principles uh, of offering giving and it was established. And then we looked at Noah and we looked at Abraham and uh, we've gone to the law and we've looked at the various kinds of giving uh, under the law and then we've looked at Jesus Christ and giving uh, as was uh, demanded by Jesus. The ministry of Jesus was supported financially by many people. Uh, there were women who supported the ministry of Jesus. There were men. Some of them were not forefront people, but they supported him. We saw one of them later at the end of the life of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, who came and took hold of the body of Christ. And the Bible says he had been a follower of Jesus, a very well-resourced gentleman. So Jesus, although he healed people miraculously, he didn't pay bills with miracles. He paid bills with money. Remember when, when, when he had to pay his tax and, and Peter came to Jesus and said, well, they are asking us to pay tax. And Jesus said, I would, I would send you to go and fish. And he says, the first fish you take, open the mouth, and there will be money there. In other words, I can, I can work a miracle, but I can't avoid money. I can't avoid money. I have to use money. You can't pay bills with miracles, but a miracle can produce the money to pay the bill. 
But you can't pay the bill with miracles. And you can't pay bills with signs and wonders. You cannot go and stay in the hotel and just say in the name of Jesus, the bill is paid. Uh, you can use the name of Jesus to get the money. But you have to pay with real money. Either through a credit system or through a check or through cash. So uh, in the life of Jesus, you find that he used money. He used money to pay bills. Jesus made uh, a lot of arrangements for what he did. You remember when uh, they were going to feed the 5,000? And, uh, and uh, Jesus asked his disciples, Andrew, what do you think can be done? And he says, even if we paid so much, we couldn't buy enough bread for the people who are here. In other words, they were used to spending money in the ministry of Jesus. By the way, he had a treasurer. And, and the treasurer was Judas, and he was a thief. Anybody whose life can be sustained or his business can be sustained with a thief as the financial controller must be extremely well resourced. Because somebody is leaking your money, uh, but, but you somehow find a way to still meet your obligations. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus used money. Jesus used money because people gave him money. There was no way he could use money unless he had received money. In whatever form he received money, uh, the important thing is that he received money. All right. So now let's go to the New Testament church, which is the heart of what I'm going to talk about today. And this will form my last uh, message in the series. And uh, I will address the issue of tithing within the New Testament. And then I would uh, address the issue of giving in the New Testament. And uh, who has the right to receive the offering in the New Testament. Remember, I said in the Old Testament, the Levites had the right to receive the offering. So if you were going to give an offering, you had to find a Levite. You couldn't just give it by yourself. You had to give it to a Levite. It didn't belong to the individual Levite who received it because it was given institutionally to a system, but it had to go through a Levite. Now we're going to see how that works out in the New Testament. So we go to the book of Acts chapter 4. And we're going to see the first offering given in the New Testament church. The first offering. Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to verse number 37. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to verse number 37. And let's hear the reading of God's word. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own. But they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. That's a very powerful testimony. They eradicated poverty. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. That is Pastor Gandhi's preferred system. <laughs> and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they, the apostles, distributed to each one, to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also surnamed Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Very loaded piece of scripture. There's so much happening in this passage of scripture. This passage is the first complete recording 
of the giving of an offering in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 2, there is mention that people sold properties and gave to the church, but there is no detail of it. And Acts chapter 4 is now giving the details of it. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John were asked alms, and they didn't give the offering. So you cannot record that because they didn't give. Uh, the man at the gate called Beautiful uh, asked them for alms, and Peter uh, didn't go to church with an offering that day and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. So that does not qualify as giving of an offering because no money uh, was given to the person asking the alms. So this chapter 4 is the first time there is a clear recording in the New Testament church of offering. Now, if you've noticed in all my teaching, I'm very particular about first mentions. The first offering in the Old Testament, the first offering in the Gospels, the first offering in the New Testament church. These are very important for us to get our principles right. We'll look at a few factors that the passage talked about. First, we'll look at the spirit of the New Testament church. The spirit of the New Testament church the Bible says that they had one heart and one soul. This was a church in unity. A church that was together. They were truly a body of Christ. One heart, one soul. Not a church in conflict. Not a church arguing. Not a church de determining to destroy one another. But they had one heart one soul. That is the spirit of the New Testament. And anyone who is particular about the New Testament must endeavor that whatever we do in the church must be animated by the spirit of one heart, one soul. The second thing you would notice about the spirit of the church, not only did they have one heart and one soul, that they didn't consider what they had as theirs. They didn't consider what they had as theirs. So people had prof property, but they considered themselves as stewards of God's resources. So if somebody had a house, they considered it belongs to God. They had a car, they would say this belongs to God. Whatever they had, they considered it as belonging to God. So they have one heart, one soul, and nobody considered what they had as their own. Third thing you'll notice about the New Testament church is that they had all things common. They were a sharing church. They shared what they had freely. And in the process, they eradicated poverty. They were able to function in such a way that people who were in church had their needs met. Not from external resources, but by pulling the internal resources. I am still confident that the church has the capacity to eradicate poverty within its membership. But for that to happen, both those who have and those who don't have must have a spirit of sharing. Because sometimes those who have are ready to share, but those who don't have are so sneaky and so distrustful that you don't give them anything. I, I have had a lot of Christian businessmen, wealthy men say, I don't want to help church people. I'd rather go outside the church and help people because church people cannot be trusted. Uh, you can't do business with them. You give them an opportunity, they're going to abuse the opportunity. Now, if we don't deal with the, process, the problem of trust and integrity, there will be so much resource in the church and so much poverty at the same time in the church. The nexus, what is missing is trust and integrity, which the early church had. And so wealth was used to solve problems in the church. That is the spirit. And the Bible gives us this background of this spirit of the church where everybody, everybody was of one heart. They, they, they were generous. They wanted to help one another. And not only was that the spirit of the church, but you also see that there is stewardship in the church. There is stewardship in the church. They sold their properties. 
and they surrendered their wealth, sold property. Beyond contributing their current income, they went ahead to dispose of lifetime assets. That's an unbelievable act of sacrifice. That people have bought land and houses and come to church and decide that for the sake of people they are not blood related to, they're going to dispose of their lifetime investment to help those people. It just only takes the grace of God for that to happen. Human nature doesn't function that way. But this is the New Testament church. So they gave up their wealth. And the Bible says that they brought them to the apostles. And the apostles chose how the wealth should be distributed. The people did not distribute the wealth themselves. In other words, you don't go and sell your house and say, well, I'm going to go and give it to so-and-so, or I'll do so-and-so. They brought it to a designated spot, and from that spot, distribution was made. This has been the system from the Old Testament right up into the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you give it to the Levites, then they did a distribution. In the New Testament, they give it to your apostles. Apostles did the distribution. So there is a focal point to their giving. In the midst of this great outburst of Christian love, one person is mentioned. And that's the most important thing I want to draw your attention to. One person is mentioned. The Bible could have mentioned anybody's name. There were hundreds of people probably giving. There were people who were probably giving a lot more than this one person. But one person is singled out. Anytime the Bible singles out one person out of so many to follow their story, the, it's almost as if God wants you to fix your attention on this, this person. God is telling you, watch it. Watch what this person is doing because that's where I want you to focus your attention. Something is happening with this person that is important. And that person that the Bible focuses on, and although, although most people will focus on Ananias and Sapphira, they came later on. But before that, the first person that is focused on is Barnabas. Barnabas. His name is mentioned. And there's a guy called Barnabas. He's called a son of encouragement. And when the Bible is describing Barnabas, it makes a notation of who Barnabas is. He is a Levite. Barnabas is a Levite. Under the Old Testament, the Levites receive the offering. They are the authorized people who received the offering. Now we are in the New Testament. Barnabas is a Levite. All things being equal, if we're operating under the law, then Barnabas should be the one who is receiving the offering. But Barnabas is not receiving the offering. Barnabas is actually giving the offering. What the Bible says about Barnabas is that he has land. He is a property owner. Isn't that interesting? Because Levites are not supposed to own property. But this particular Levite is an entrepreneurial Levite. So although he doesn't have an ancestral land given to him by right from God, he works to buy land. And by the way, he's not the only Levite who owned land. Jeremiah was also a Levite, and God instructed him to buy property, to buy land. So it, it stands to reason that among the Levites, there were people who were entrepreneurial. And although they didn't have a tribal land, they had personal possessions, and that's where Barnabas is. He's worked hard, he's a Levite, and he has property. This Barnabas, a property owner sells his property, sells his land. He doesn't give 10% of it. He doesn't give 50% of it. He doesn't give 90% of it. He takes all the money he has acquired from his property and he goes to the apostles and puts them under the apostles' feet. Now that is a figure of speech. 
It doesn't necessarily mean that you put the offering under their feet directly. Uh, it means that you put it under their control. Bring it under their command. Bring it under the control of the apostles. It may have been that they put it directly at their feet, but it doesn't necessarily mean that. It means that it is under their control. They now have oversight of it. What does that tell us? In the Old Testament, the Levite receives the offering. In the New Testament, the Levite gives the offering. The Levite represents the priesthood system of the Old Testament. And in this act, the priesthood system in the Old Testament has changed from the Levitical order to the apostolic order. So, the one who is qualified under the Old Testament is not qualified in the New Testament. There is a new authority system that God has set up, and that new authority system is that of the apostles or people whom Christ has called and ordained and set in office. By tribe, Peter does not qualify to be a priest. By tribe, Matthew does not qualify. By tribe, None of the apostles, Andrew, Philip, none of them qualified. But by calling, they qualified. By this offering, God is signifying that what qualifies a person to be a man of God has moved from birth to divine grace and calling. And the people that God has called divinely now are set in office and they have the right to receive the offering from their brethren. That is what Barnabas is telling us. So in this significant moment, the Old Testament receiver of offerings is transferred to the New Testament office of grace. And I will get back to it very soon when we get to the book of of, um, of Hebrews and Ephesians, and we'll see why that the apostles had the right to receive the offering. So, somebody is going to say, well, the Levites, pastors today are not Levites. Yes, I'm not a Levite. Pastor Gandhi is not a Levite. No pastor, well, there could be some pastors who are Levites, but it doesn't matter. So why do you receive the offering? This is for the Levites. Well, it changed in Acts chapter 4. The Levites lost the right because the Levites passed on that power to the apostles. And Barnabas is the one demonstrating it to us. That from now onwards, it's not a Levitical system. It's an apostolic system. It's an apostolic system that is authorized by Christ to receive the offering. Does a non-Levite therefore have a right to receive offering? Yes, a non-Levite can because the Levites submitted in the church to the apostolic office. That is something very important for you to keep in mind as we go now to try and wrap up some of the things we talked about in the Old Testament. Note that receiving an offering does not mean it belongs to you. It means that you are just a receiver. In other words, if somebody puts an offering in my hand, it's not mine. I'm receiving it institutionally on behalf of the church. So, you know, when I, when I was a younger pastor before our church grew, and you don't have one of your young pastors, the church doesn't have systems. And, and many times people would come and say, oh, pastor, I wasn't in church on Sunday. And they would come to my home. I didn't have a church office then. And they would come to my home and say, this is my tithe. And, and they would leave it to me. But I had enough sense to know they were not, I am not supposed to buy, you know, get, tell my wife, you know, money has come. Let's go buy some goat and, 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 and kebab it. No, I have to wait on Sunday to take it to church and put it in the offering because I am just a receiver, not a user. I'm a receiver. So don't ever mistake the user or the receiver as the user. And don't ever think that, you know, when the money is, is, is being given, the offering is being given, then you say, wow, today pastor is going to smile. 
The pastor may smile because he now thinks, oh, we can do all the things that God has told us to do. We can go out and do our outreach. We can do a program that we wanted to do. We, want, we can build the building we wanted to build. That is what gives the pastor the smile, but not because he's going to take that money and literally chop it. <laughs> so when they were laying on the apostles' feet, Peter did not go home and say, hey, wife, guess what? Market was good today. The people really gave. And even Barnabas sold his land. And it's now ours. No. They were only custodians. Distributing as they felt led. To determine where the need is. In other words. If you don't trust. That the person receiving your offering. Is using it well. Then go to somewhere. That you trust. That your offering will be used well. But don't say that. Because somebody is abusing your offering, you will not give. No. Go to a place where you can trust. This is an apostolic office. I can trust that a fair distribution can be made of the resources I treasure and have given. And if you believe that this is a church where your money is well used, and I think Jesus House is a phenomenal church where there is integrity, where there is accountability, then you can give everything. Including 100%. <laughs> which is the New Testament system. All right. Now, remember on the first day on Sunday, we talked about Melchizedek. And, uh, and, and that he showed up and received an offering from Abraham. And... Uh, we said that this was a strange guy. He came in uh, after Abraham had risked his life. He had not fought in the battle. He hadn't lost the property. And he gets a tithe of all. Now remember that when the Bible says a tithe of all, you have to understand what is normally recovered from warfare in the Old Testament. Just go and read your Old Testament well. When they go to war and they recover things or they get what they call the spoils of war, it's not usually agricultural products. It will be gold, it will be silver, it will be clothing, it will be uh, other implements and so on and so forth. So for anyone to think that tithing is only limited to agricultural products does not understand the basis of the New Test Old Testament. You have to understand the spoils of war that Abraham gave a tenth of was not agricultural products alone. It was everything that was captured in the battle, including weapons of war and other implements, cooking utensils and so on and so forth, inanimate objects, as well as goat and sheep and so on and so forth. All of it, Abraham gave a tenth of all. Just to let you know, the tithe does not just cover agricultural products. It goes beyond agricultural products. All right. Now, let's dig into... Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 7 from verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, not part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the son of God, remains a priest continually. Continually. Now consider how great this man was. To whom even the Petrarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed those who are the sons of Levi. Who receive the priesthood. Have a commandment to receive tithe from the people according to the law. That is from their brethren. Though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them. Received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. I love that. 
He blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here, mortal men receive tithes, but then he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithe through Abraham, so to speak, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Two important people are mentioned here. Levi, a descendant of Abraham, received tithes according to the law. Levi or Levi. Then the second person mentioned is Melchizedek. Without genealogy, like the son of God, received tithes also. So you see that there are two tithing systems the Bible is bringing to our attention. Two tithing systems. Levi, Melchizedek. The order of Levi receives tithes. The order of Melchizedek receives tithes. Now when the Bible is talking about Melchizedek, the Bible makes it clear that Melchizedek is not a Levite. But he received tithes. And then he says that Levi also received tithes. Then it qualifies a little bit about those two entities. It says that when you are dealing with the Levitical order, he says here mortal men receive tithes. Where is it here? Here it's talking about the Levitical system. It's, a, it's for mortal men. It's a, it's, 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 a, it's a law of men, the Levites, they receive the tithe. But there, Leviticus, it's an immortal man or a person who lives forever. He receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. Now, what is the Bible saying about this? It simply means that when Melchizedek showed up, to Abraham and received tithes. The Bible doesn't discuss him again. Later Hebrew writers discuss him and conjecture as to who he is. But the Bible doesn't re discuss him again. He almost enters the scene and exits the scene. But the Bible says he didn't die. Because he lives if he lives, is there an old man somewhere on this planet who has been around for 5,000 years? Where is he? He says he lives. How, in what form does he live? He lives like the son of God. In other words, Melchizedek is a manifestation. He is not born of a woman. He is manifested. He is what you call a Christophany. He is manifested. And when he is manifested, he represents somebody else. But he cannot stay permanently because he doesn't have permanent legitimacy to live on this earth. The only way to permanently live on this earth is to be born of a woman. And since he has not been born of a woman, he shows up and he goes down goes out. But later on, Melchizedek is born. We know him as Jesus, the son of God. So that when Jesus is born, he becomes a priest. Now, on what basis is Jesus a priest? You know, Christians say Jesus is a high priest. On what basis? Because Jesus is not a Levite. If he is a priest, then he is continuing something that has already started. And he has the power to receive what that priesthood receives. So, Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7 from verse 11. Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priesthood should arise according to the order of Melchizedek, and not to be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. 
For he of, him, of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. Yet it is far more evident if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ, a priest from the tribe of Judah, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, what does that mean? It means that whatever Melchizedek received, Christ also receives. It actually means that when Abraham gave that tithe to Melchizedek, he was giving it to Jesus Christ. I've heard people say, does Jesus receive, Jesus never received tithe. Oh, he received tithe from Abraham. Jesus is a tithe receiver. Not according to the Levitical order, but according to the order of Melchizedek. The challenge most people have is that because the law codified tithing and placed it under the Levitical order, we think that tithing is only related to the Levitical order. But before tithing became related to the Levitical order, originally it was a Melchizedek order. And the one who succeeds the ministry of Melchizedek has the power to also receive tithe. Hebrews chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Jesus, a priest forever according to to the order of Melchizedek. So, there is a Melchizedek order, there is a Levitical order. One order has ceased, and one order continues. The Levitical order ceased when Jesus said, it is finished. It ceased. It has no enforcing power. The law ceased when Jesus died on the cross and grace began. So, probably if you are a Jew and the Levite, Levit Levites in, 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 in Israel, can go and receive according to the law because they, they are still operating under the law. But for the Christian, the law ceased. The problem with the church is that we have developed all our theology on tithing on the Levitical system. Which is biblical, but non-functional. It's biblical, but non-functional. It's non-enforceable. So if you are a preacher and all, everything you say about tithe is according to the Levitical order, there's going to be some problem with, with your theology. It's going to be a problem. Because the Levitical order has ceased. It's gone. Including all the verses you associate with tithing from the Levitical system, is gone. That's it. That's the truth. It doesn't mean tithing is gone. But one system of it is gone, 
and the original system has been reinstituted because the order of Melchizedek takes precedence of the order of Levi. So there's tithe being collected, but not through a Levitical system, but through the Melchizedek system. And so when people come in and give their tithe these days, you are not giving it according to the Levitical order, you're giving it according to the Melchizedek order. Because Jesus still is the priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now I know the question people will ask is, well, if Jesus is receiving the tithe, where is he? <laughs> is that a correct, that's a nice question. Is, is, is the pastor saying he's Jesus? Are you Jesus pastor? I'm not Jesus. I have him in me, just like he's in all believers, but I, I am not physically Jesus. I cannot claim that, and no preacher can claim that. So, in what way is Jesus ministering now? Okay, that's what I want to answer. Now, I'll go back to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Now, this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. It says that Jesus is a high priest. Jesus is a high priest. How many of you know that? He's a high priest. Okay. And it says that he's seated at the right hand of the throne in majesty. We all agree with that. And not only, so Jesus is a high priest. He's seated at the right hand of the throne in majesty. What is he doing? The next verse says, he's a minister of the sanctuary and the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. So Jesus is a high priest. He's seated and he's still ministering. So in what way is he ministering? For Jesus to be seated, he had to ascend. And you know what happened when Jesus resurrected and, and had his last meeting with his disciples? He ascended on the Mount of Olives, went to heaven, seated, high priest. So who is going to do his work? Because if he's gone and is seated, how is his work going to be done on earth? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, tells us whom he gave the power to do his work here on earth. Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 7. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lowest parts of the earth. He who ascended is the, also the one who, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. So Jesus ascends on high. He is the minister, the high priest of the order of Melchizedek. If he is the high priest of the order of Melchizedek, he's gone up. Who does his job? The Bible says whilst he was going up, he released gifts to men. And he called some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers, some pastors. What are they supposed to do? To do his work. So what he has power to receive, the people he leaves behind have also power to receive. Those people, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the teachers, and the pastors are also operating in the priesthood of Melchizedek. Because he is a high priest of the order of Melchizedek, and these ones are functioning in his authority. That is why the apostles could sit 
and Levi will bow and bring his offerings. Because when Jesus went on high, the order of Melchizedek was dropped into the lap of the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. They, therefore, are authorized by Christ to continue the ministry of Melchizedek, to bless the people, to give communion to the people, and to receive the offering from the people. Not for their own benefit, but for the work of the ministry, so that distribution can be made. Jesus set these offices to operate in the church. The big problem with the offices Jesus sets and the ones that are set by the Levitical order is that there is predictability with the priesthood of the Levites. It's predictable. Your father is a Levite, you are a Levite. Your grandfather is a Levite, you are a Levite. It's bloodline. Apostle is not passed on by bloodline. Prophet is not bloodline. So I can't say, well, I'm a pastor because my father is a pastor. No. I can't say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an evangelist because my father is an evangelist. It's not, it's not passed by, it's not hereditary. Whereas the priesthood of the Levites is hereditary. So you can predict and say, this is a Levite. He can be a very silly Levite, but he's a Levite. He's, he can be a very, you know, whatever Levite, but he's a Levite because he's a Levite because he was born by a Levite. And, and so his character may not be the best thing uh, to really determine. So you, really, you don't check a Levite's character to determine whether he's a Levite. And if you check the Bible, you realize Eli, his sons, they were doing stuff in the temple. Stuff. But they were still ministering. Because they are from the priesthood. So, you know, they, 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 they were sleeping with the girls in the temple, but they are priests. So, it's irrevocable. You can't unpriest them. Are, are you following me? It's bloodline. It's bloodline. It's bloodline. So, Really, how do you know the Levite is correct? Because he's a Levite. How do you know? Uh, why should I give my title to this Levite? Because he's a Levite. But he's a thief. He's a Levite. He's a fornicator. But he's a Levite. His father is a Levite. So it's, it's predictable by birth. However, when it comes to the apostles, prophets, and, and, and so on, the gifts of Christ, it's not hereditary. How can you then tell who is true? You can't say, well, his father is one or his mother is one. Jesus said, by their fruits, you shall know them. In other words, if the guy is fooling around with all the girls in the church, you can't say because he's anointed, he's still anointed of God. No, by their fruit. The legitimacy of the Melchizedek order is the character of the purveyors of the office. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to be perfect people who don't make a mistake, but people who habitually, habitually do the wrong thing cannot still be considered to be operating in this office because the basis for evaluating whether this is a legitimate apostle, a legitimate prophet, a legitimate evangelist who can receive from me what God wants me to receive and bless me as God wants to bless me is check their character. Check their character. Nobody is perfect, but there are certain things that are grievous that when a leader gets into, not once, not twice, but becomes a pattern. You cannot continue seeing this guy is living in fornication, in adultery, blatantly, and still say, touch not the Lord's anointed. We can't say that. This guy is abusing the wealth that he's a steward of. You cannot just say that. So, 
If I am a Christian, I still have to give. And by the way, I personally don't teach tithing because it's too small. 10% is too low. I go the Jesus way. Hundred percent. That is it. That's Jesus. So, Pastor, does it mean when I take my salary, I should bring all in the offering? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that everything you own belongs to Him. Everything. In the Old Testament, 10% belong to him. The New Testament, 100% belongs to him. So when you're giving, remember he owns all. So to just limit yourself to 10% and, and give the 10% and think, oh, I've been so righteous, you have just become a Pharisee. With the 10%, you've just hit Pharisaical level. Grace is very interesting. 10% is just pharisaical level. If you want to go beyond pharisaical level, you really start giving in the New Testament when you give beyond 10%. Because 10% is the law. But grace is more abundant. That we like to quote God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. Well, the same principle that works in your prayer works in your giving too. <laughs> exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ask or think of. So let me ask a few questions as I bring this to a conclusion. Question number one, did the tithe cease in the New Testament? Did the tithe cease? My answer is not exactly. The reason I say not exactly, because Levitical tithing ceased. But the tithing, the original tithing system continues. And so believers can tithe. Remember, tithe means tenth. And just from my own personal story as a person, and I, I'm not saying that follow me, I'm just telling you this is how I've lived my life. I started tithing when I was a teenager because I went to church and they said we have to tithe. And basically it was Levitical, but you know, the pastor was sincere and preached it and I felt well it's a good principle and so I've always tithed from when I was a teenager but I determined that I would always give more than 10 percent and from when I was a young Christian my ambition has been to give 90 percent of my income and live on 10 percent for that to happen you need to make a lot of money so I'm still working on it But I have never given 10%. I've always given more than 10%. Always. There have been times I've given 100%. There are times I've given 50%. Sometimes I give 80%. Sometimes 25%, but never 10%. 10%, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Pharisee. I just want to be a Christian. And my righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. So as a young person, I made that promise to myself and I've kept it up to now. Whether I earn money as a businessman 
or whatever I do, I give. And I give more than 10%. All right. So that's, that's just me. But it's a good example, I believe. So I don't really emphasize on tithe because tithe simply means tenth. And for me, it's too low. So the second question, is the tithe our highest, highest standard for giving? No. The tithe is the minimum standard for the New Testament Christian. If you are learning to give, you start with 10%. That's how you learn. I just, I'm a newborn believer. I just received Christ last week. I want to give offering. What should I do? 10%. As I mature in Christ and I know how to worship and speak in tongues, 15. <laughs> Well, he owns the hundred, so what's the problem with 15? And as God blesses you more and you become more prosperous, 20 and 30. And you have to believe God to the point that 10% will more than take care of everything you need in life. Don't you want to get to that point? How much do you think that somebody like Bill Gates lives on? Probably not even 1%. When he gives away those billions, it's because really, he can give them away. Because God has to bless you to the point where you can give 99% away and keep one. But that one will be a hefty one. Because some people's one is more than other people's hundred. Now you have to believe God that your one will be greater than your hundred today. That's what you believe God for. So progressively you become a giver. Because what you want to say as a Christian is, I give everything. I give everything. I give everything. I give my life. I give my all. Because I love God and I give him everything. So you work to give. We work to give. So is the tithe our highest standard for giving? No. The tithe is the minimum standard for New Testament Christian. What is the New Testament standard of giving? In the New Testament, we are free to give all we have to honor God. He who is forgiven much, loves much. In the New Testament, you don't have a fixed percentage. You don't have a fixed percentage. You have a guideline. The guideline is your righteousness must exceed that of the Pharisees. So start with 10% upwards. That's New Testament. But you are working yourself up so you can give everything. Wouldn't it be great the day when you receive your salary and you see it in your account and you write a check covering the 100% and give it away and still live? Because these guys who were giving their lands and houses, they didn't die. They didn't become broke. No. They became more prosperous. Have you, have you ever wondered how Cain could tell that God had received Abel's offering? How could he know? I mean, when I was a child, um, you have this children's uh, Bible thing, and you see the smoke going <laughs> straight, and it goes up. They say, well, the, the smoke went up. Yeah, it could be possible that smoke went up. I don't think that's what happened. How can you know? How did they know that God respected Abel and his offering and not Cain? By the results. His flocks kept increasing. His business kept increasing. Cain 
is still in the ground and he's not making progress. And then they concluded it has to do with their offering. God has honored Abel and his offering and Cain is in trouble. He's broke. That's how they got to know one offering is received and the other is rejected. By the results. Not smoke going up. How can you know that God is honoring your giving? By the fruits. By the results. You give. It is given unto you. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over. Men give to your bosom. I have been a pastor for a while and I know from experience, observation, stingy people in the church are the broker's people. And I've seen people who are very generous who are constantly prospering, constantly prospering, constantly. And they are the biggest givers. They give and they prosper, give and prosper. That is the Abel system. How do we know he's been blessed by God? By the results. How do we know God respected the offering of Abel? By the results. His flocks prospered. How do we know that God was with the house of Obedidom? By the blessing. You just could see the results in the house of Obedidom. There is blessing in the house. It's not about smoke going up. It's about life improvement. It's about success in what you do. It's about blossoming and flourishing in all that you do. How can you know God has received your offering? Because you're doing better. You're doing better. Where should we take our tithes and offerings? To a church under the stewardship of a genuine ministry gift set by God, set by Christ. Do you believe your pastor is called of God? Then you give in this house. If you go to another church and you feel this guy is making a fool of everybody, he's not giving, uh, he's not, you know, really genuine. Go to another place where you can give and give. You cannot use the mistake of a pastor as an excuse to stop tithing and giving. It is like saying you would not pay your taxes because the mayor is corrupt. And there are a lot of corrupt mayors. Or city council is corrupt, so I, I'm not going to pay my taxes again. Try it. You cannot use a person's shortcoming to annul a principle of God. If you cannot do it here, do it there. If you cannot do it there, do it here. God said to Israel, you have to look for the place and give it. So, if you think this is not the right place, go look for a place and give it. But never, ever use anybody's mistake as an excuse to stop tithing. Go to the place where there is a genuine ministry gift of God and give. How should the tithes and offerings be used? For the support of God's work? For church staff? For church services and projects, for Christian charity. Sometimes people forget that most churches have staff who are not pastors. Who also do a lot of work who need to be paid. And the tithe and offerings are used for that. Is that how Jesus House DC uses the offerings of this church? Yes. I believe that is how it is done here in Jesus' house. That is why I commend. If you're looking for a place to go and give to the order of Melchizedek, you are in the right place. You know it already. You are in the right place. There is a place of integrity. It's a place of character. There's real effort. Every time I come to this church, there's one program, program or the other, one project or the other, to improve people's lives. Whether it's seminars or workshops or training for business people, helping people to live their lives up, that is what church is all about. But it is the money that comes in that is distributed. When we say distributed, it doesn't necessarily mean that money will be put in your hands. 
You know, I know most of you will like that. You come to church, and after church, everybody gets $20. <laughs> That's not how you distribute, because some people don't need $20. Some people may need $20. Others don't need $20. Distribution does not mean put money in their hands, literally. It means that create an opportunity for them to benefit. And sometimes just the music in the church is one way that your money is working for you. Your tithe works for you through the worship. Because you can come to church depressed, down, and see somebody just worshiping, and you lift up your holy hands and begin to worship, and you live here free. That is the tithe working for you. That is your gift coming back to you. You hear the instrumentalist playing the instrument. That is your gift coming back to you. You feel the air conditioner in this place. That is your gift being distributed to you. You light the screen. That's your gift coming back to you. That is how you're blessed. There is distribution being made. People's lives are improved. You go for projects and programs and there is a discount on it. That is your, your gift, your, your giving coming back to you. That is distribution going on in the church. And every church finds the best way to do that. And we give back to our people. You know, one of the things I've come to realize, every institution that makes money is praised. When the bank makes money, it's praised. Business makes money, it's praised. Small business becomes mega business, it's praised. A teenager makes money, everybody say, what a genius. 25-year-old is a billionaire. Hey, the greatest sensation in the world. A football player plays for 90 minutes and makes $100 million, and everybody's praising him. A boxer goes to the ring for 45 minutes and makes over $100 million, and he's a hero. The only institution on this planet that people criticize when it makes money is the church. Think about it. Just think about it. Why are people so afraid of the church making money? Why is that a big deal? Why don't we go, uh, people beating people in the ring and making money? Don't, I mean, between that and what the church does, <laughs> let's face it, which is more productive? Are this guy just pump, 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 somebody's daddy, pump, 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 pummel him, blood all over, collect $140 million. <laughs> and we all clap, wow, what an achievement. Go to the WWF. Pummeling each other and collecting money. People going naked and collecting money. I mean, look at all the things people do to collect money. And, you know, people will say, well, you know, they are working for their money. But what are we also doing? <laughs> you think I've been joking here all this time? I'm working we train for this we go to school for this we build we pray we plan this is work but it's almost as if our work is illegitimate it's illegitimate and other people work is more legitimate Somebody tells me, yeah, but you have taken from the poor. Who doesn't take from the poor? <laughs> Even the poor takes from the poor. <laughs> the people who go to watch the basketball game, are they rich people? No. The people who buy the season's ticket, are they rich people? No. So the basketball player, who bought the Lamborghini, where did he get the money from? From the poor. The doctor, somebody's sick, he's dying. He comes to you and you make money off him. What a profession. Somebody's at a point of death. 
begging for their lives and you're making money. Everybody does his job and the people who think they have benefited from the job reciprocate. And we are not even saying give all the offering to the pastor. Most pastors are on a salary. I was just reading an article that pastors are some of the lowest paid people because they are the highest qualified and the lowest paid. In many church denominations, you cannot be a reverend minister without a master's degree. Most people have PhDs and they are earning very low salaries. And even that, people are complaining. And they are, well, they will complain about people who have bought jets and people who are living luxurious lives. You know, I cannot defend anybody's jet, but the thing is, it's nice to have a jet. <laughs> I can defend it. I can't say good or bad because I don't own one. If I have the chance to own one, will I? I think so. <laughs> I think so. Maybe not, I don't know. But I'm not going to defend whether somebody should better buy a jet or not buy a jet, live in a big house, or a small house. That's a personal choice. Somebody said to me, you know, so how are you big preachers, you big preachers, you, 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 you have to live humble, you have to be humble. I said, yeah, well, I'm a humble guy. I think I'm a very humble guy. <laughs> you know, you, you who are telling me I should be humble, I hope you are humble. <laughs> but, you know, let's face it. There is a basis for determining remuneration. There is a basis. So let's say that I start a church and I'm the pastor. And I start in a small classroom and there are 20 people. 20 people who are not doing so well. So the offering is miserable. I am their pastor. So I say, okay, the people are miserable, money is miserable, I'm not going to take salary. We'll use it to get a better meeting place or buy equipment, buy a keyboard, buy a guitar. So we use the money for that. And then the church becomes 100, from 20 to 200. So they say, okay, well, we think pastors should get something. So they pay me something miserable, but the church is miserable, so I'm getting a miserable salary. The payment is commensurate with the income. Now, you can't expect that when the church grows to be 1,000, I should be paid as they were paying me when they were 100. Because it doesn't make sense in any system. You know, in, in our church, we use a, a professional consultant to determine salary ranges. We have industry standards and we use all kinds of variables to establish what is the standard salary. And we have benchmarks that we work with. But you cannot tell me that when I move from 100 to 1,000, I should be paid as I was earning at 100. And then when it becomes 10,000, I should still be paid as I was earning 100 because you, you want, I have to be humble. I mean, I don't mind. If you want me to be humble, give me coupons of hum humility. <laughs> humble coupons. And let me take those coupons. Thank you. And, and give me authorization. I go to Neiman Marcus, and they take humility coupons. <laughs> issued by my church. So I take it, humility coupon, and I buy a shoe. Now, if humility would not be a currency for me, I think I would prefer you convert the humility to money. Don't you think so? So the church now grows to be 10,000, 20,000, 40,000. Then I have not only one church, I have two churches, three churches, 10 churches, 1,000 churches. You still want me to earn like somebody who is in a classroom, 
which industry on this earth, which vocation practices that? Which vocation practices that? Tell me. Even the Boy Scouts don't practice that. Red, Red Cross doesn't practice that. Which vocation? Nobody practices that system. So why do people have a problem when a person obviously has been able to work and increase what he had, you still feel that his reward should be pegged by a non-performer? It doesn't happen in any vocation. Whether you are a teacher, you are a doctor, you are a lawyer, you are a carpenter, you are an electrician, you are a footballer, you are a WWF wrestler, uh, whatever you do, nobody pegs remuneration that way. So why does anybody think the church should peg remuneration that way? I believe churches should be modest, and I, I believe that we should be mindful because we are modeling Christ and we, we want to uh, help people. And so there should be a certain level of sensitivity and emotional intelligence relating to the audience. You don't flaunt your wealth and, uh, and, and in the face of people. But those are personal things that people must develop. But let's use common sense in all the debates. And I've heard people say some of the most unintelligent things. And saying it confidently, you know, when people are unintelligent, you expect them to be very measured. But th these are very brazen <laughs> and unintelligent. And I'm asking, where did you get this knowledge from? I mean, what, what is your benchmark? What is your basis? I am a pastor. I oversee hundreds of churches and do all kinds of stuff. I've done, been doing this for almost 40 years. And you want me to be paid like somebody who just started and has three people. You know, I don't know, am I making any sense now? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense across board anywhere. So for anybody to brazenly speak of those things and get people to hail it. Because human beings sometimes are very slow to apply knowledge to what we hear. So we don't, we don't connect the dots, connect the dots, connect the dot. So when you hear somebody is criticizing somebody for something, take time and ask yourself important questions. For some people, having a bicycle is a luxury. I remember when we were kids, there's a man in our neighborhood who, who bought a motorcycle. And he's the only one who had a motorcycle in our neighborhood. And he was the richest, I mean, in our minds, he was the richest guy. When he closed from work and we hear his motorcycle arriving, all the children will run and run around him as he, drive, he comes with a motorcycle to park. Because motorcycle was money, wealth for us. Because when you are living among people, poor people, you know, poverty is very normal. Then another guy bought a car. I remember it so well. It was a Simca. It's one of these uh, Eastern European stuff. And we forgot the motorcycle guy. Because <laughs> he's been beaten. Now for some people, motorcycle is the biggest deal of their lives. For some people, a car is the biggest deal of, of their lives. For some people, a Mercedes-Benz is the biggest deal. For some people, a BMW is the biggest deal. But for some people, a, a Mercedes-Benz is nothing. And so when you haven't boarded a plane before, and you hear that somebody has bought one for himself and he's driving it all by himself, it is very annoying. 
It's very, very annoying. Me, I haven't boarded one before. You, are, you have one packed in your house. It's very annoying. But what, what is a big deal for you? Has, everything has context. Everything has context. And when we apply the right context, we can determine whether this is frivolous, or this is right, or this is disproportionate, or this is proportionate, uh, and so on and so forth. These, these, I believe, are commonsensical ways to determine all these matters. But please, you are a Christian first. And whether you like going to church or not, you must give. It is the mark of your Christianity. Somebody says, I give my time, I give my energy. Give money. <laughs> Jesus said to the man, the man says, show me how can I have eternal life <laughs> in these times, how to be born again. Jesus didn't say, go and say the sinner's prayer. He says, go and sell everything you have, give to the poor, come and follow me. In other words, the tr true test of your devotion to me is what you are ready to give up for me. And you cannot say that you love Jesus, but you don't give up anything for him. Just your time and your effort. Give your money for where your treasure is, there your heart is. You want to know people's heart? Check where they put their money. If it's in Manchester United, that's where their heart is. <laughs> if it's the Washington Wizards, that's where their money, their heart is. If you're a Christian, your highest financial donation should be to the church. If you give money to any other cause, Apart from the cause of Christ, you've missed it. Your devotion to Christ is number one. And where your money is, that's where your devotion is. I trust God has helped you. And I hope that I've answered every question you have concerning the subject of tithes, offerings, giving, and so on. In a couple of months, I'm, I'm bringing out a book on the subject where I'm covering far more in depth than what I can do in preaching. And uh, you can use it as a reference material just to guide yourself. And if you have any questions on that issue, um, maybe one day I'll be able to address them. In trying to prepare this message, I thought through every question that has been asked and tried to answer each one of them from a biblical point of view.